Saying no actions were taken in closed session. Robin, you're up for the operating budget, 1415. Turn it over to you. Okay, so this is the second reading of the operating budget. This is the um, action item related to this next fiscal year's budget for your consideration. I do have a short slide presentation <laughs> that does some um, line item comparisons between this proposed budget and our current year budget, as well as shows you the changes that we have made since it came before you as a first reading in September. So I want to make sure that we make you aware of those changes. So what I, I have first here is the line item comparison between the current fiscal year and the proposed budget year. As you can see, the change in the full-time equivalents as well as in the various categories of expense. So in state government budgeting, we talk about category one, two, and three, and that's what these represent, salaries, benefits, and OE&E. &E. So operating um, expenses and equipment is the OE&E &E line. So you can see those changes between the current fiscal year and the next fiscal year in the proposed budget. These are not separated by fund. So in the item, we actually break things down in a finer granularity. This is rolled up for the entire system. Next, you can see the overall comparison as opposed to fiscal years 12, 13, and 14 from the total dollar amount as well as from the FTE perspective. The, the adjustments from last year include the reversal of a one-time funding request for the field office in Orange County, the member service center. Um, in addition, we have an increase for estimated increases in salaries, and then we have the budget change proposals that we're bringing forward with you, which includes one that's got a significant number in it for a large-scale technology project around our pension solution. Um, what we've tried to show in this slide are the administrative adjustments that we've made between September and November. This is a, this is a frequent occurrence in our budgetary process because we get revised numbers that are more accurate as we move from the uh, preparation during the September time window into the November time window. And you'll see that in the cases here, all of our estimates have gone down. So we had estimated high and we're showing the readjustment of those um, both the retirement rate and the pro rata adjustment, as well as the salaries and benefits, uh, we're showing a decrease in the request based on the uh, further clarification of the rate changes that we've received in the intervening months. Um, there's also a change in the number of FTEs that we're asking for. The net, re the net is in a reduction, and this is really uh, reflecting two things. The, there's an increase in, the, in one of the BP. BCPs um, related to investments and financial services branch to deal with the transference of uh, responsibility from external to in internal management. So we asked for four additional FTEs in that arena to make sure that we had the uh, administrative support we need for procurement and budget processing related to those activities. You'll see the reduction in the uh, client outreach and guidance area, as well as in the tech projects. This is not a true reduction in the overall number of people we're going to be, we would propose hiring, but it's really a classification of those positions <laughs> as um, temporary in, in basis rather than uh, asking for a new budgeted position. And this is in response to the um, process we've been using over the last year, as well as this year, to make sure that our we're reflecting our typical vacancy rates and not asking for permanent positions beyond which we typically have vacancies in. So it's moving more from a position-based budgeting to, to a dollar-based budgeting. So we make sure that we don't have any more permanent positions that we typically have filled. So the real change here is the request for the increase in four positions as associated with the BCP for investments and financial services. Um, this next one is about the Teachers Deferred Compensation Fund. And again, we just want to bring to your uh, attention it, the, the desire to have the authority to go 5% above the initial budgeted amount in the event that we have revenues in terms of cash availability to make those expenditures. So this is a situation where we would like to be able to have the expenses rise to the extent that we have achieved a different level of activity on the revenue side. So this is, again, something we've been doing over the last couple of years, but I just wanted to make sure that we brought that to your attention as a part of the um, uh, resolution process. And then the other, the last thing, and again, this is this is consistent with prior years. We do have an operational 
increase associated with the new member service center that's proposed in this budget for the Inland Empire that relates to ongoing operating costs. So the one-time request in the 1415 budget gets the center up and running in terms of the tenant improvements and those kinds of activities. But then on an ongoing basis, we have the need for the additional expenditures so that we, we don't put that in the, the next year's budget because we end up opening that office probably late in the year, but we need the increase for the full year in 1516. So we've bundled that in here as well. And that's, those were the adjustments that I wanted to make sure I brought to your attention. And I'm certainly available to answer any questions that you might have on the budget package. All righty, give us a minute. Evrena? I wanted to mention that Robin had been working with staff from the Department of Finance about exactly technically how to allocate or to uh, request the funding, uh, the one-time funding on the technology project so that it will, I think, be a better outcome in terms of not having to ask the legislature to reappropriate the money in future years. And so that'll all kind of happen behind the scenes and her staff are working with uh, Department of Finance staff on that. Super. Thank you very much. Any other questions about the budget? It is an action item. We need a motion to approve. Tom? Uh, I'll, I'll move and hopefully somebody second. Uh, okay. All righty. Tom has moved and Sharon has seconded approval of the 1415 operating budget. Is there any further discussion? Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Um, I'm just curious. Um, X the one time expense. It, how our expenditures match, match up as a percentage of uh, total revenue relative to other comparably sized or uh, pension plans. They seem relatively low, so. Right. Thank you for bringing that up, Tom. Um, what we tried to do was to include some of that information in the actual item this time in response to a question that you had last time, and I'm sorry that I didn't call that out. That was my error. Yeah, I was just trying to look for it again. I thought okay, so it. It, it, I'll turn your attention to, ooh, I don't have the item that has the TRB numbers on it. Um, yeah. Go ahead and just give us the oh, page. No, no, it's 115, excuse me. Yeah. So you'll see the comparison um, just in terms of how we uh, compare to another large California system as on the operating budget, the investment expense, the percentage of cost as opposed to net assets and the cost per member. So we tried to lay that out for you so you could see that basis of comparison. Again, it's on TRB 115. Yeah, yeah. I'm having trouble. My apologies for not calling that out. Oh, there we go. Yeah, but it's still close. Yeah. Huh? Go up a little bit more. Huh? Up a little bit more. Up. It's at the very, yeah, it's at the very top of that page. Oh, okay, there we go. There are a lot of numbering systems that work good. So the first column is the number of members and bennies. The next column is the net assets. Then we've got the operating budget, the investment expense, the percentage of the uh, expenses as related to the net assets, and then the cost per member. Mm -hmm. And you'll you'll see that as we've laid this out, our costs are less. Yeah. And as I indicated before, we do have other comparables, but we were trying to eliminate the geographic inconsistent that might be associated with somebody something in in let's say Texas. I'll just say that that's a lower cost. You eliminated that geographic. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, anything more? No, thank you very much. All right. Grant? Thank you, and thanks, Robin, for that comparison. You don't name the other pension system, but I'm wondering if it's one that has a health benefits program as well. <laughs> <laughs> the important distinction. No, that's, that's absolutely correct, Grant. Yeah. Not, not normalized for differences in the program. Dana? Um, we also have included the resolution for the 1516 oper operating budget augmentation, so I was a little bit concerned about the motion. So it's both for the 1415 budget that we need action as well as the 15. And also the augmentation, Tom? 
Page 115. 115. TR, TRB 115. It's... Uh, Page three of the and it's just item. But it's CalPERS broken out, the retirement part broken out from the health benefits. No. Right. right. These are the full numbers, oh, so okay. that's both okay. grants. Point. So, Tom, going back to your motion, <laughs> yeah. we have two resolutions. Correct, Robin? Correct. Mm -hmm. So, we have the, the budget for 1415, and then the second, I have to wait for it to come up here. For the um, augmentation, and again, that's which is the IT project member service oh, center for the member service center. Inland Empire. I would recommend taking them separately. So I think you already have a motion on the okay. to approve right, the uh, budget. Alrighty, that sounds good. Alrighty, Paul. Yeah, I. The, the only question I have is, is it's not a question. I would just, um, in the future, appreciate maybe if we could <coughs> see um, sort of a summary of the current year budget compared to the proposed budget for the next year, kind of on a line-to-line -line item basis. It, it was difficult to see, right. the to, to understand, uh, uh, you know, what it was that we were, what, we, what it was that we were um, uh, approving. Um, there was a lot of specifics about there's a there's a change here or a change there, but in terms of the the overall budget, uh, you know, not not enormous detail, but but maybe you know a pages worth of detail of of uh, revenues and expenditures by line item this year compared to the the budget that we're being asked to approve. Thank you. Certainly. And Robin, I'm thinking that it might be beneficial for us to get that when we first start talking about it. So, like, this is the we talked about it also in September, didn't we? Right. So right. maybe not necessarily this meeting, but the meeting prior to that. Certainly. You know what I mean? To Does the, that make sense? Paul? Yeah. So yeah. you yeah. want it in September, and then we can carry <coughs> right. it forward with and any carry adjustments forward. that we've yeah, made so in those. We would always have that uh, information. Absolutely. So. I, I understand right. the concern, and we can certainly address that. That's why I put this up, was to try and give you that overview. But right. obviously, it's not at the detailed level that would provide you information on how much we're spending on travel, for example, <laughs> versus... Right. Um, yeah, thank you. Ready? Anyone else? Tom? Just horsebacking this. It seems like we have sources of revenue that are equal to about... 11, 12 percent of assets, is that about right? And then we have expenditures that are about 8 percent of assets, is that right? I don't have a calculator on my, uh, on my uh, iPad otherwise. I'd... But that, I mean, that, that seems about right. And, uh, and so the investment return is just about co is coming close to covering uh, payments. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Right. So what you're so I'm on TRB one fourteen, mm -hmm. which shows the sources of funds and the uses of funds. So we have a, a sources of funds totaling a, yeah. Um, yeah. eighteen point eight billion, and then a use of thirteen point six. If I'm rounding right. properly. And as a percentage of total assets, I think I'm in the ballpark as right. I get what those right. are. Okay. Right. All righty. So we have our resolution on TRB 125. We have a motion and a second on the floor to approve that budget. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. And any abstentions? We've approved your budget. So then we also have the augmentation. For the Inland Empire, that's on TRB 127. I'd entertain a motion to approve that. It's been moved. Second. All right, it's been moved by Sharon and seconded by Tom. Is there any further discussion about it? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Any abstentions? All right. Inland Empire is going to get their service center too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Our next item is uh, Ed. This is also an action item on the 403B Comply financing. So come on in, Ed.
So yesterday at Benefits and Services, when we were sort of going over the and a report on the different defined contribution programs, I mentioned uh, one of the programs is a, a program where we provide compliance services to enable uh, school districts to comply with the various regulations associated with 403B plans. And that was a program that was initiated <clears throat> back in 2007 pursuant to legislation that was enacted um, the prior year. As part of that program, there was some initial funding that was provided pursuant to statute that was authorized by the board. And that funding is, is from employer contributions that otherwise would have been credited to the defined benefit program. And then ultimately over time, that the, the, the money that was credited to the, to the startup costs of this program gets, does get credited to the DB program with interest on the actually assumed investment return rate. At the time that the board authorized the startup costs, which um, they authorized up to $645,000, the expectation was that the repayment would be completed by 2015. Um, we actually only ended up spending about $445,000, but unfortunately, because of some issues we had with the startup and the an initial contractor that we had hired uh, to perform the service who wasn't a really able to, to deal with the marketplace of California, we haven't been able to grow the program as rapidly as we thought. And since, so we wouldn't be able to meet the, the expected 2015 timeframe. So we're back to you today to propose an alternative refinancing scheme, which essentially me, which would essentially commit that any revenue that we receive from the program, because we receive about 50 cents uh, per month from every participant who's in a 403B plan for which we do administrative services, all that money would be credited to the DB program to repay, uh, to credit the DB program for the money they should have gotten. Um, we can that still works with the program. We don't have any ongoing expenses internally, so that it's it wouldn't it wouldn't um, detract from our ability to, to run the program to do that, and it would enable us to meet the commitment that we had made when when we established the program. And if assuming that we earn the um, continue to receive the revenues that we've been receiving in the past we would be able to repay the entire amount by around 2021. So um, we have before you a resolution that would uh, memorialize all that and uh, ask you that to adopt that resolution and be happy to answer any questions that you have. All right, any questions? Sure. <clears throat> Can you restate the resolution in a, like a, a in one well, the sentence? Resolution, <laughs> it, it, basically the resolution have, is, yeah. is to adopt new terms and conditions which specifically states that um, any revenue that's received from, from the program uh, will be credited to the teacher's retirement fr fund until such time as the amount that's payable to the fund is fully paid. And that's the essence of what the, of what the condition is. So basically anything that we receive from the program goes to the, goes to the teacher's retirement fund to, to pay that until we fully compensated the teacher's retirement fund for what they should have received. Until that loan is repaid. Right. Okay. Tom? Uh, just, uh, there must be some background that I, I don't quite follow. Sure. Uh, but um, given the size of this relative to our the budget we just approved, why are we stretching this out? Well, we're, we're stretching it out because, I mean, we're, we, we don't have, we don't have the revenue from the program. I mean, why are we continuing the program? Or why are we, why are we? Why don't we just? Pay it and as the revenue. Well, we, don't pay have, as we don't have the revenue to pay it off. We regenerate revenue from the operation of the program. Right. Because we collect fees. Hang, small, hang, small hang on, Em. Yeah. Go back to yeah. when so we it's create. A separate fund? When we yes, create. It's a separate yeah. fund. It's one of the. It's yeah. a spe yeah. So let me. Okay. Let when me back we created up. the 403B comply, you <laughs> took money from the system to create it. We took. Well, we didn't take money. Or, from no, the system. no. We, we redirected money that would have gone to the system. would have gone to it. Right. To pay for it. Now we've got to repay. Yes. What would have gone to it to right. be diverted, and it and it goes. Those monies go into a special fund specifically for this purpose, to for the fund the program, right? And and a portion of that of those contribute of that that revenue would have gone to repay, to compensate the teachers retirement fund for the money that should have gone to them. We can't do it as quickly as we had originally planned, and so what we're saying is, any any dollar any money that we received from the program which would otherwise go to the special fund, it would instead go to the retirement fund. Mm -hmm. And it's a fully compensated retirement fund for, for the money that it, had, that okay. it provided. 
Yeah, but it's uh, the thing I wasn't getting is that it was a special, yes, separate it's a special fund. fund. Okay. Sorry, yes, that was the, that was that's the distinction. Yes, Terry. Ed, do we expect we can meet that new schedule? Realistically, I also, I mean, and it's, and it's a high possibility we could be we could do better than that if we can get some. You know, there there'll be new um, you know districts who will who will have to look for a compliance administrator at some point when their contracts run out. We'll certainly go for that. Business, but we we hope that we'll be able to meet that. This, this is uh, this revenue is supposed to. This is not revenue that is necessary to support no. the, the operations no. of the program. No. And where has this money been going in the past for operations of the program? It, it initially went to for the startup costs. We've been basically we've been basically putting every dollar in that we could. Um, into the, in, into re, to basically credit to compensate the retirement funds. So we've been we haven't been pile, we haven't been stockpiling the money or retaining it. We've been putting in to meet the commitment under the existing under the old repayment schedule. So we basically we've been doing this. Now we just want to really just memorialize it to recognize that we're not going to be able to pay it off in the time frame that we initially thought we could. All right. Thank you, Paul. So. <clears throat> on TRB 132, the, the table there, um, which talks about what a new repayment schedule might look like, and it's pretty conservative, shows that that $48 million was paid back in 1213, and 125 million looks like uh, was paid back uh, on July. Thousands. Those are thousands. Thousands. I'm yes. <laughs> yes. It's a different program. Darn. It's a different program. Darn. Darn. Right. Darn. I remember it's a different program. <laughs> Yes. Um, but those payments were made? Those payments were made. Okay. Yes. Okay. So it has, in the last couple of years, started to generate yes. money to pay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Sure. And just to clarify, so the speed in which we will be able to pay it off in the future is we might be able to pay it off sooner if we get more contracts as, is it TS, what's the term? As a uh, third party? Uh, TPA. TPA. Oh, TPA. Yeah. TPA. Yes. Okay. So then, Ed, that begs the question, what are we doing to promote our program as a third-party administrator? Well, we, we respond. We, we are aware whenever any entity is, is uh, soliciting an administrator, and then we respond to those RFPs, and we continue to do so. It's so just it's a, all done through an RFP, not yes. necessarily marketing? The, yes. Well, you know, we, you know, we obviously have ongoing communication with employers around the program, but they almost always get them through an RFP, and we respond to those. All right. Thank you. Sure. Do we have Do we have statistics about how? Because ours is gem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how? What proportion we have of of all the? We have we have about ten percent of the districts, but we tend to get the smaller districts. Um, we have some significant districts, but um, a lot of the times we get the business that nobody else wants because they're, they're small. But that was to a large degree that was that that was there was those districts that were most concerned about. Making sure that they had compliance capabilities. So I, I can't tell you offhand. I can, I'll find out how many, how many employees, what percentage of the employees right. we cover. But I can tell you that the number of 165 is about 10 percent of the districts. Okay. And do we know of any districts that are doing this on their own? I'm sorry. What? Do we know of any districts that are doing this on their own, without? A I'm not aware of any. Okay. It's too complicated. If they are. They. I mean, she, I mean, if, if they are doing that on their own, I. Be worried about how well they're doing it. All right. It's it's complicated stuff. No, I agree. I agree. Any further questions? All right. This is an action item. We need to pass a resolution that can be found on 133. We need at least we need to act on it. I should put, put it that way. I'd entertain a motion to approve. So Tom has moved. Second. Sharon has seconded. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. Any abstentions? All right, that motion is passed and we've approved that resolution. Resolution. Thank you, Ab. All righty, Robin, you're back up. Now, Robin, are you going to want us to go to audits and risk management to actually look at the financial statement or are you doing slides for everything we need to know? Art? Yeah, no, I don't think you need to go to that one. Okay. Because we have a, um, um, we did financial statements. Okay. And then the presentation that we'll be going to. Super. If anybody wants to see the full. Financial statements. 
the full financial statements. You can find them in audits and risk management. Uh, that was item three, attachment one. This is one of our most favorite items. So come on. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. I'm sure, everybody's already read the financial statements. <laughs> <laughs> if you need to look back at them for any type of reference, how's that? Um, All right. So we're here today to go over the financial statements with you. Um, so on our agenda today is um, to discuss the internal control report that the auditors presented yesterday at the ARM committee, um, to talk a little bit about the accomplishments this year, um, to go through business direct and the impact it had on our preparation of the financial statements. Then we'll roll into a discussion of the actual financial statements themselves, um, looking at the management discussion and analysis, um, the strip financial statements, pension to you, and then notes the financial statements. And finally, we'll wind it up with talking a little bit about what we expect in terms of changes next year. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that the board had an awareness of the um, actions that have been taken by, um, by management over the course of the year in addressing the uh, material weaknesses and significant deficiency that we had from last year's audit report as compared to what we have in this year's audit report. Um, I think the thing that we wanted to bring to your attention was the deficiency in particular over member data and the fact that that is something that is going to be very difficult for us to address without a new pension solution. So to make sure you have that awareness as we discussed in more detail in the ARM committee. Um, in terms of the other areas, I, I think I want to point out that as an entity, we have worked very hard to address the um, awareness and, in, and, in, and encourage all of the members of our staff to be cognizant of internal controls, and the auditors recognize that. So I just want to shout out to all of all 1,000 people that make up our staff and the fact that they have taken this very seriously, and that was recognized by the auditors in this year's um, report on internal controls. In terms of the internal control over financial reporting, we still have a material weakness, and um, the acknowledgment there is that it was partially we implemented. Some of that is reflective of the fact that we have been operating this past fiscal year on two systems, and so the the uh, deficiencies that we had from the prior systems environment lingered through for 50% uh, of the year. And it's also reflective of the challenges that we faced in conversion um, and implementation of a new financial reporting system and one of the complexity that we have with SAP. So I don't want to mis mislead anyone on that, but lots of people worked very hard to make the progress we've made. The other one had to do with an internal control over financially significant systems, and there are some remaining comments on that, but those were rolled into the comments related to internal control over financial reporting. But again, the issue that I wa just want to make sure you're aware of is the fact that the concerns around mem member data are, are concerns that are likely to linger over the course of the years until we have addressed those via the implementation of a pension solution. So with regards to the accomplishments, I suppose the biggest accomplishment would be that we received an unqualified opinion. So we're all very happy for that. Um, I believe the auditors are referring to it as an unmodified opinion, opinion yeah. which is a change. Um, again, just echoing what Robin said, there was a lot of hard work that went into um, actually going through this conversion, um, dealing with the post-implementation cleanup, um, and actually compiling the financial statements. Um, so um, moving on. We met, we were able to meet our deadlines for providing a draft and final set of financial statements to the external auditors. Um, we finalized those financial statements on October 15th. And we were also to meet, um, able to meet our SEO mandated deadlines for the legal basis reports and the gap basis financial statements. Um, the legal basis reports were due to um, the SEO on um, August 20th, while the gap basis financial statements were due, a draft version was due to them on October 1st, and a final version was due to them on October um, 15th. And then, in addition, we, oh, sure. Because I'm, I'm, you know, we deal with accreditation a lot, you know, in California with, with uh, education. Unqualified opinion, does that mean, what, is, what does that mean exactly, that language? Um, it essentially means that the auditors didn't find any material misstatements on the financial statements um, that would cause a reader or mislead a reader in terms of the financial position of the organization. 
Are there great, I mean, because, you know, usually you're like show cause or there's kind of three or four different, I don't know, phases of approval, if you will. Is that the same? Do they have the same language with? Well, they're different. There are different types of opinions that an auditor can give depending on, um, you know, the, the results of their audit. You know, on the extreme end would be a going concern, which would mean that essentially the, the organization is, you know, on the downward spiral. Is there more than that? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of depends on, on okay. the nature so of the just, opinion. They can have okay. scope limitations um, on their opinion where, you know, they'll render an opinion on a portion of the financial statements, but maybe not on another portion, depending on, you know, whether or not they were able to validate information or had the, you know, the data to validate certain aspects of it. They could offer an opinion against a different set of standards, like on a cash basis or for tax purposes right. or, you know, so there, there's a range of things that they could okay. say, uh, what we want is an unqualified okay. or unmodified opinion based okay. on U.S. GAAP. I mean, that's what we're looking for, is we want to make sure that the readers of our financial statements can have confidence in the Got information it. that they're seeing. And it's critically important to the state of California due to the, the inclusion of the pensions as as liabilities right. or, uh, related to bond disclosure. So, you know, it's something we need to achieve. It also helps us in a credit enhancement role, et cetera. So did I... Did I? Yep. Okay. Well, yeah, if I can just <clears throat> maybe <laughs> add a little bit to that as, as the chair of the audit committee, which maybe means I know something about this, but maybe not. Um, <clears throat> uh, these financial statements are CalSTRS financial statements. They're not financial statements of the auditor. The auditor didn't, didn't prepare it. The audit, the audit firm came in, took a look at them, and said, can we trust these? You know. Independently, do we believe that that the that Robin and her staff and everybody at Calsters who was working on this did an accurate job of putting these together? And what the unmodified opinion says is yes. We we say that that people who look at these statements can have confidence that they accurately reflect the financial condition of Calsters. Is that a, okay? We rely on similar kinds of opinions related to our alternative investments, for example. So on an annual basis, we get financial statements from those general partners, and that's part of what we look at when we're doing our fair valuation assessment, is, is the opinion unmodified or unqualified, or was it prepared against a set of standards which we are, we're not as comfortable with? You know, depending on the location of the investment, those statements might have been prepared in a way that we we don't have as much confidence in. So, and so now moving on to uh, business direct and its impact on our financial statements. Um, of course, as you know, business direct had a significant impact on our ability to prepare the financial statements this year. Um, with the you know mid year conversion, it um, added a lot of complexity to the year in process. Um, but I want to say that it's brought a lot of, we see a lot of benefit coming out of it. In the past, when we'd um, generate the financial statements um, from a closing process, it was a very fragmented process where each one of the business areas within financial services would sort of have their own process for closing it. It wasn't integrated. Um, some of the processes were manual. Um, so what that resulted in was that various administrative subsystems may not necessarily have been aligned or agreed with our general ledger. So it means that our internal items were, or internal information was sort of out of sync. Um, so that presented a lot of problems. Now with implementation of SAP, it's an integrated process. And so you go through a sequence of closing different parts of the system and it results in, you know, our administrative subsystems actually agreeing with our general ledger. So it gives us confidence that, you know, information that we provide to the SEO on the legal basis statements agrees with the information that we provide to the Department of Finance for budgetary purposes. Um, with regards to the financial statements, we were able to generate them out of Business Direct this year. Um, however, we did make some manual adjustments to those financial statements because of various mapping um, issues. So for example, a GL account may not have been reflected on the right line item of those financial statements, so we made adjustments for those. With regards to the tables and the schedules that are in the notes of the financial statements and within RSI, um, we compiled those in Excel, um, similarly to how we've done it in the past. 
Um, the reason for that is that this information or these Bob J reports that we would use to generate that, um, they weren't completed by, by the time we got to, to year end. So our plans for next year are that um, we would generate the, the financial statements, all the schedules and the tables out of SAP or Business Direct. Um, we're currently going through a process right now where we're closing, going through a closing of September um, and we're gonna generate you know, everything out of Business Direct, we're gonna be looking at you know, whether or not um, there need to be changes made to those reports and get those changes made so that we're in a position to use them before next year end. So I just wanna take a minute to put this into context. Um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna misquote this, but I think we've gone from maybe uh, in the hundreds of GL accounts to in the thousands. So the level of granularity we have in information is significantly different. So you can understand the problem in terms of meshing the two parts of the year. And you can understand the challenge in a con from a conversion perspective because we mapped the old systems to a series of conversion accounts and then we had to take the data and fan it out so we could get to the level of detail that is what we need for analytics. So I don't want you to be, what I'm trying to do is to allay concerns that I would have around why were you doing this stuff in Excel? And it really had to do with the fact that those data were not consistently available at the same level of detail as well as the reporting structures being late. And so we're working very hard to make sure that next year we're gonna be ready for that by doing it three times before the end of the year, <laughs> so. And so what I would say is although it took us um, an additional two weeks to actually complete the financial statements, um, which we agreed to with the auditors. Um, I definitely can see the uh, benefits coming out of SAP and the fact that um, you know the integration of the system is definitely gonna be something of benefit, especially from a control standpoint. And that I think as we transition through this um, period of stabilization um, and get a better feel and understanding of the system that we'll definitely be able to capitalize on its benefits and should be able to prepare the financial statements on a more timely and efficient manner. Um, now moving on to um, management discussion and analysis. And this is coming out of the actual financial statements. This is a chart that we have in there. Um, the management and discussion and analysis really provides sort of an executive view of the financial statement and the organization as a whole. Um, this chart essentially is prepared with um, information out of the financial statements and it shows the growing gap between the contributions coming in and the benefits being paid out. And this really just goes to confirm information that's probably been relayed to you through um, other discussions within the organization. And again, usually that gap is made up by um, investment returns. And this information right here helps to go, helps to explain the reason for, for that gap. This information um, was derived out of data coming out of the CAFR and it shows the ratio of active members to retirees and, and beneficiaries. And as you can see, the um, the ratio is, is decreasing, meaning that um, you know, we have less active members compared to retirees, which results in less money coming in and more money going out. Now we'll move on to the financial statements themselves. And again, these are a set of condensed financial statements that you would find within the MDNA. Um, this is for the strip. Um, and the strip for us is, is really comprised of DB, DBS, CB, and the Teacher's Replacement Benefit Fund, our program. Um, as you can see, um, investments increased by 8%. Um, and of course, this was because of the strong investment returns. Cash and cash equivalents increased by 11%. And that was because of an increase in um, short-term securities that were close to maturity. Uh, with regards to our, our cash, we actually had about $349 million on cash at year end, where the rest of it was made up of a cash equivalence. And cash equivalence really represents um, highly liquid investments uh, with maturities of less than 90 days. So examples of that would be like CDs um, and repurchase agreements. Um, the investment receivable, um, you can see it increased quite a bit. And this, um, this will fluctuate quite a bit from year to year depending on when open trades settle. Um, the member and employer and other receivables, um, you know, slight increase um, or slight decrease. Um, looking at the capital assets, um, it stayed relatively the same. Um, 
you know, decreased a little bit. Our main capital asset, our primary capital asset, is actually this building. We also have some intangible assets in there for some of the systems that we have. And you would generally expect to see this decreasing over time just because of amortization and depreciation. Now, looking at the liabilities, the benefits and process of payment, process of payment increased, um, and that's primarily due to a timing effect, where this year the June payroll or allowance roll wasn't actually paid until July, and therefore we had a pretty big, um, pretty large liability outstanding at year end, whereas last year the June allowance roll was actually made in June. Um, investment payables is very similar to receivables. Um, that can fluctuate quite a bit depending on when trades um, settle. The loan payable line um, really represents borrowings that CalSERS have, has. Um, within that line item, we account for our, our master line of credit and our term asset loan facility. It decreased um, over this last year just because, amount, um, because of amounts that were repaid. The um, other liability um, increased or decreased by 51%. And that's because, again, this is a timing difference where we had t federal and state tax withholdings that um, were outstanding at year end last year that weren't made until July, whereas this year we actually made those payments in June. Um, so overall, when you look at the net position, happy to say that it increased by um, 9%, almost 10. almost 10. Even with that negative cash flow. So moving on to um, the statement of changes in fiduciary net position, um, when we're looking at member and employer um, contributions, there was a slight increase. And it's very difficult for us to really get an understanding of what that increase is because we have very limited information or insight into the payroll doc or information coming from the school districts about our only visibilities into the credible comp figures that are provided to us. Um, but our assumption is that this is probably a result of, you know, furloughs increasing or maybe rehiring. Um, looking at the state contributions, there was a slight increase, um, and that was because of an increase in a factor that's used to calculate additional contributions that are due to us for a certain membership um, population. Um, investment income increased dramatically, not surprising given the investment returns. Um, when we're looking at the other additions, um, you know, there was a 69% decrease over the last year. And this is the result of uh, an interest, or CalSTRS had recognized um, approximately $3 million in interest associated with a, a legal settlement between CalSTRS and the state of California on an SBMA payment that was withheld, I believe, in 2003, 2004, in the amount of $500 million. Um, we didn't have that same interest recognition this year. Looking at the benefit payments, um, you can see that there was a slight increase, and this isn't necessarily unexpected. I think that's generally the trend that we saw, we've seen, and the chart that I showed you earlier would sort of confirm that. Um, plus you have the 2% COLA that's added every year. Um, looking at refund of contributions, um, again, there was a slight change there, de decrease. Um, looking at the administrative expenses, uh, again, relatively small change. And then the other um, category for deductions increased um, by 34%, and that's the result of an increase in bad debt expense and also some legal settlement fees that we paid out. So, any questions or no? Okay. So with regards to pension two, um, the net pension increased by 77%. Million and again for the same reasons as the strip, it's because of strong investment returns. Contributions decreased ever so slightly by forty-three thousand. Um, again, net investment income increased because of strong investment returns, and happy to say that the overall membership increased by eight percent, meaning that people are capitalizing on this opportunity. Now we're gonna move into um, a discussion of the notes, the financial statements. And I'm gonna go over the, some of the ones where probably the more important. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but just the ones that I think probably have you know, more weight or more, more value. So within note one, this is where we really provide a description of CalSTRS, um, the plans that we offer, the funds that we administer. It has information with regards to those plans on the contribution rates that are assessed and um, the benefit structures for each one of those. Um, 
This year, there probably um, we had a pretty significant change with regards to the DB program in terms of um, the new benefit formula for two at sixty. Um, so we spent a lot of time and effort actually trying to break that out. Um, the description of two at sixty two from two at sixty, just to provide some you know visibility of the differences. So that the PEPRA law change obviously had an impact on how we describe the programs within the financial statements. And so we need to take that shift that we all understand and make sure that we can uh, describe it to our readers in a way that they understand. So we, we, we now have that language and we'll use it as we proceed through the years. But in the year of transition, it takes us quite a bit of effort to develop it. So moving on to note two, this is where we really provide, again, a summary of our significant accounting policies. The basis of accounting that we use is accrual basis. We recognize um, revenues when they're earned, and we recognize expenses when they're due. Um, with regards to the use of estimates, the two primary estimates or biggest estimates that we have within our financial statements are around the um, calculation of the actuarial accrued liability, and also around the fair value measurements that are used for private equity and real estate. And this was highlighted, um, you know, in the auditor's report. Um, again, cash and cash equivalents, we discussed that a little bit earlier. With regards to investment and investment risk, um, or investments, within this note section, we provide a pretty lengthy detailed description of the different investment line items on our financial statements and what investment types are included within those line items. In addition, we also um, discuss the fair value methodologies that are used for the determining the fair value of those assets. Our capital assets policy essentially is we capitalize anything or um, over a million dollars and we cap, we amortize or depreciate assets over a straight line period depending on their useful life. On expenses, um, within this note, we describe how we handle investment expenses. And really, the um, cost of administering the investment portfolio is really handled as an investment expense. So you'll see management fees, advisor fees, and consultant fees, along with salaries and O&D costs represented as investment expenses as opposed to administrative. Um, here, with regards to security lending and reverse repurchase agreement, this is just really describing how we handle those um, programs in terms of recognizing the cash associated with money that's coming in for those and the offsetting liability. Um, reserves, we provide an overview of the reserves that are um, legislatively mandated. So moving on to note, th sure. All right, we were just having a little sidebar discussion about investment expenses. What's not included in investment expenses? Um, what's not included? Well, like salaries and, and um, OE&E for people who are not directly involved in investment right. activity are not there. Mm -hmm. We don't allocate out the depreciation, for example. Right. So we don't, we don't have the allocation of the underlying indirect costs. So it's the direct kind of expense that's in that number. But it does include our staff. Right. Yeah. So if you look at our financial statements, we actually have, in a sense, our administrative costs broken out across two line items on our financial statements. So the cost of, you know, like administration, um, the benefit area, salaries and wages are reflected as administrative costs in one area of the financial statements, whereas the salaries, um, the salaries and the OE and E costs, travel costs, management fees, et cetera, are reflected in a different area of the financial statements. They're reflected under a line item um, so called help investment me on other. Management fees. If we have a managed account or uh, <coughs> account with a financial institution that's a direct investment account, we'll have a management fee. And that'll be included. If we invest in a partnership that incurs a management fee, would that be included or not? So the, the alternative assets are sh shown on an NAV basis, right. so that would not would not be included in those investment expenses line item because that's really a, attributable to the to the partnership. And then, I believe we generally would capitalize those as part of the asset value, especially if they were paid as part of the capital call. Okay, and uh, if we buy and sell securities, if we pay a commission, that's an expense. Well, on the, on the purchase side, typically the commission is capitalized with the value of the asset, so it's not recognized as an expense. 
on the sell side, the commission we would pay generally gets netted out against the income or the loss. Okay. So you, you really don't, you don't see it on, on that line item. Okay, that's helpful. Um, now moving on to note three, this really gets at the actuarial information, actuarial information regarding the funded status of the plan. Um, and you're gonna see some slight differences between the information that's presented here for the DB program and the MPP program than you would with regards to the information that's provided to you in the spring of each year. And the reason for that is that there's a, there's a, there's a $424 million liability that gets accounted for within the DB program for actuarial or for funding purposes that for accounting purposes we have to exclude because it essentially ends up double counting that liability when we present the prepare the financial statements. Um, so from a financial reporting perspective, um, the unfunded liability um, for the DB program approximately, uh, increased approximately um, 6.7 billion to 70.5. Um, for DBS and CB, it remained, um, or it's unfunded. I mean, there's no unfunded liability for either one. And looking at the Medicare premium payment program, this is really from an accounting perspective looked at as being funded on a pay-as-you-go basis. But from a funding standpoint, it's actually looked at as being fully funded. So for accounting purposes, um, it shows right now that it had an unfunded liability of $581 million. Um, and the funded ratio is 0.1%. So again, this is gonna differ slightly from information that's been provided you know, in the spring of each year regarding the funding of that. And, and again, in, in this coming year's financial statements, these numbers will be more significantly different just because of the requirements from GASB 67 in terms of what we have to do from an actuarial perspective for accounting purposes versus what we have to do for funding purposes and the use of different kinds of measurements in those assessments. So this is the last year where that al the alignment is going to be as close as it is. And even to Tom's prior question around, you know, where our investment expenses are, are called out or grossed versus net, that's again an area that GASB is exploring with the preliminary views that they're bringing forward. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to steal the, the changes, but, but again, these are things are being discussed so that we, we may be seeing changes in how we present that information. The only caveat I would add to that is that the Medicare premium payment program will essentially stay the same because GASB 67 doesn't impact OPEB. OPEB, OPEB is something that GASB is working on and um, should be coming down the pipeline sometime in the hopefully far future. <laughs> Um, this next slide is coming out of RSI. It's, um, it's not actually part of the note disclosures. It's a different schedule within required supplementary information, but we thought we'd go over it here just because it's tied to actuarial data. Um, the ARC really represents the contributions that are needed to fully fund the program um, on an ongoing basis. And as you can see for the DB program, the contributions we received represented 44% of the ARC Whereas for DBS and CB, um, we received 100% or a little bit more in DBS's case. Um, with regards to note four, um, deposits and investment risk, the purpose of this note disclosure is really to um, provide a financial statement user information regarding the risks that um, risks associated with how we've invested this money and whether or not those risks could impact um, any obligations that we have or impact the services that we provide. Um, you'll see attached to these different bullets or along with them, that's the accounting guidance that really provides the structure for this note disclosure. Um, with regards to the risk schedules, um, for both fixed income or debt type securities along with derivatives, we're, provide, we're required to provide a lot of disclosure around um, the credit risk, interest rate risk, foreign currency risk associated with those investments. Um, there wasn't any significant changes in any of the information that was provided in, in, in those tables over the prior year. Now, with regards to new accounting pronouncements, as you can see, there were a number of new accounting pronouncements that actually went into effect for this current fiscal year. Um, none of them really had much of a material or much of an impact to CalSTRS. Um, however, we did have to go through each one and go through 
a vetting of it, an evaluation of it, and document it to show, you know, to ensure that it didn't have an impact to us and also to provide to the auditors to let them know that we had done our due diligence. With regards to GASB 63, that's about the only one that had a direct impact to us and it simply required us to change the titles on our financial statements from net assets to net position. So not, not terribly significant. Um, now what we'd like to talk to you about is what's new for next year. And again, the biggest change which has been discussed quite a few times or on a number of different occasions here is, is the implementation of GASB 67. So what we'd like to do is just talk to you about um, exactly what we see those changes are for, for next year with regards to our financial statements. Um, as a result of GASB 67, we'll be adding the target allocation for each investment asset class to the notes. We'll be including a calculation of the net pension liability um, for the strip. What we're gonna do is, in the past, you looked at the actuarial information and the financial statements and it was broken out by DB, DBS, and CB. Um, well, under GASB 67, we're gonna combine that all into one, um, one evaluation. So it's gonna be at the strip level, which will be in alignment with the way that we present information on our financial statements is at the plan level. Um, again, we'll no longer provide information on the funded status of each plan, but rather we'll provide information on the net pension liability for the SRIP as a whole. Um, funding tables will be replaced by summarized calculations of the NPL, um, which will essentially be the total pension liability less plan fiduciary net assets or net position per the financial statements. Um, we'll include in the notes a long-term expected rate of return by asset class, and also um, a plus or minus 1% sensitivity analysis of the discount rate effect on the net pension liability. And we currently provide something similar to that right now within the MDNA where we have a table in there that provides some information on the impact if um, the discount rate changes. Right, and then that's where we also compare the um, actual, the unfunded liability under the actuarial versus the market value of assets. So looking at the required supplementary information, this is where we're really gonna see a change. There are gonna be a, quite a few new schedules that we're gonna to have to include. One of them is a 10-year detailed presentation of changes in the components of the net pension liability, including total pension liability and fiduciary net position. A 10-year schedule of net pension liability at a summarized level. A 10-year schedule of employer contributions, which is similar to our schedule two that we include in the financial statements currently a 10-year schedule of money-weighted investment returns. And then, although this isn't required by GASB, it's something that we're gonna include in our, in our statements to assist the um, school districts, and that's a schedule of state and school district proportionate share of contributions. Um, the other change that we're looking at making next year is how we present um, the investment values on the face of the financial statements. Currently our presentation is somewhat aligned with, um, with the asset class presentation by which the portfolio is managed and we deviate from that in instances where GAAP requires us to. So what ends up happening is that the values on the face of the financial statements don't necessarily tie directly to our note disclosures which are generally more on an investment type perspective. And then in addition to that, it doesn't really tie to values um, that are presented from you know, from the way that the investment portfolio is managed. So there's a disconnect. In addition to that, um, it's difficult for readers to get an understanding of what's actually within each one of those line items. So what ends up happening is we have to provide um, a lot of um, description within our note two of those investment line items describing exactly what's in each. And in some cases, you'll find that the same investment type might be included in, in several line items. Um, our initial thought is that we might go with a single line item on the face of the financial statements called in investments. And then what we would have is a supplementary schedule uh, within the financial statements that would break that line item out in, by investment type. So that, for example, we might have an investment type called debt and have that broken out by U U.S. Treasury notes, bonds, um, U.S. Treasury tips, agency bonds, and mortgage-backed securities, and corporate bonds, et cetera. What this will do is it'll allow us to have the information hopefully tie back to the note disclosures for the investment tables. It'll be an easier tie back. In addition to that, it'll also put us in a position 
for when the new fair value guidance comes down for GASB to have a table already in place where we can provide information on the um, fair value inputs that are used in determining or measuring those, those mm -hmm. investments, which is guidance that GASB is currently working on and you know, it's gonna come down at some later point. So with that said, any questions? I know it's a lot of data, I'm sorry. I guess the bottom line is too that next year's financial statements won't look the same. No. Yeah. They'll be a lot different. Sure. They'll be a lot different. <sighs> I just, I just want to uh, repeat something that we, we talked about at the um, arm committee yesterday, which is to, to, to thank everybody, yeah. um, Robin and Art and mm -hmm. the whole staff, um, as well as our auditors who are not here today. But um, this was a, 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 you know, a challenging year of transitioning from the old system to the new system. And um, we know that uh, a lot of people worked very, very hard, and it, it's actually uh, quite an accomplishment that we should all be very appreciative of you for that we are sitting here in November that we are reviewing the financial statements with an unmodified opinion from the auditors and um, so I think that's a great success um, and uh, it's nice to have that now behind us as we move to next year when everything is going to look so differently but but uh, really appreciate that very much thank you thank you very much awesome job right thank you Paul Anyone else?